Mary Ellen Carsley is a scientific and botanical illustrator, as well as an art educator. A former practicing architect, she has illustrated eight books and numerous articles for national and international journals. Welcome, Mary Ellen. Good morning and welcome to everyone and welcome back. If And thank you if you are coming back uh, again. And uh, so uh, I'm Mary Ellen and I'm going to, we're here in my home studio here and we're going to talk today about how to draw a pine cone, but in our um, journey together, our hour and a half journey together, we're also going to be um, reviewing or introducing, depending on where you are in your artistic journey, uh, drawing fundamentals, and then also how to deal with a subject that is seemingly overwhelming and complex, something like the pine, like the pine cone. So uh, we'll go ahead and do a quick recap of what we were doing last week. Um, some of you, uh, some of you, I hope uh, you had a chance to work on your drawings and things. So I will show you where I'm at on my work. Uh, and to uh, but before I get there, one of the things I will do is I'll share with you my web page so that you can see uh, where we are for to help orient yourself if you would like to have some reference pictures and things like that while we're working. So when you go to my page, just follow the green print. OK, and this is our drawing trees section. There's a lot of detailed information here that you can read and kind of go step by step by yourself. I go into detail as well about materials. And I do also have recommendations about different books and different references that might be handy to have on your studio, on your studio bookshelf. I also like to provide some examples of master drawings. Uh, so so uh, particularly from um, the Western European tradition, the uh, 17th through the 19th centuries, we've got some terrific drawings, both in pencil and in ink here. So to give you a sense of, you know, what a successful drawing looks like, what a and by successful, we mean visually engaging drawing, and a drawing that makes us not only want to look at it, but also captures the essence of the subject. So I uh, also here, as we scroll down, you'll see we ha I have some references for some different kinds of pine trees. We looked at last week, we looked at the whole pine tree. And then there's also some examples of how to get started with the sketch here, as well as where we've been going. If you want to learn more about pine trees in the Mid-Atlantic region, I realize that many of you are from, uh, are from beyond the Mid-Atlantic region, but there is a field guide from our local Department of Natural Resources that you can download for free there. And again, reference pictures of what we're going to be drawing from today if uh, you don't have pine cones handy. So you are so you have pretty much everything you need here on this website. So I hope that that's, that that's going to be helpful to you uh, to have that, to have that handy. So uh, now where we left off is last week, we looked at the pine tree as a whole, and then we looked at the entire pine branch. And then today we're going to focus specifically on the pine cone, as I mentioned. The thing that I want to remind you, and even if you weren't with us last week, it, it doesn't matter. You can just, just embrace the moment here. What I want you to keep in mind is, is that no matter how large the subject is, we deal with it in exactly the same way. So what we do is we, and you're going to hear me say this over and over again. And again, don't feel like you have to take notes. Everything's on my website. So everything that I say is going to be there and you can go back and, and reference that. So just relax and, and uh, get yourself set up to draw and use your eyes and your, and your head and your hands and, and just, uh, and just, take it all in as we're here. So I'm going to switch my camera now so you can see 
um, my sketch pad. So this was where we began last week. Okay, we began looking at the entire at the entire tree. Okay, and when we talked about the entire tree, the thing that we and you're going to see those of you who were here last week, you're going to notice that I added some I added a little bit of watercolor to my drawing. But the first thing we always start with is we always start with that main axis and then we start with the overall shape of the object. OK, now you can see a little preview of coming attractions here. You can see that with pine cones, this is exactly how we're going to approach it. We have that main axis there. And then we talk about that large shape. And in this case, it's a very conical shape that we have. And that and that's how we look at. So no matter how big our object is, whether it's an entire tree or it's a pine cone, uh, it, or if it's a pine cone, or if it's a tiny bud, we're always going to begin by looking for that large axis of symmetry, okay, and that major shape of the object. That's what we look at. We start at it very, very simple. Now, I want you to, for those of you who are feeling unconfident about drawing, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is, is that as we draw, we use the same basic skills over and over again, okay? So again, we're looking for those big shapes and we're looking for those major lines. Now, where did my drawing go from last week? Well, let's, let's zoom out a little bit here. And I left it partially unfinished. And, and don't worry if you're if you get a little bit blurry while I'm moving my my uh, drawing around. That's okay. That's just our our digital tool catching up with us. So don't panic. Okay. So you can see here that I've left the drawing halfway unfinished because one of the things I think happens to us especially when we're getting started on any on any kind of endeavor is there's kind of a magic that looks like it happens when you know it, think about when you watch Olympic gymnasts they make it look easy and yet it's impo it seems impossible so one of the things that I like to do is I like to reveal the process and so when we see how a drawing goes from from, ba from basic shapes and, and these construction lines and then increases in, in detail. And then eventually, if we, if we choose to, we can add some color to it. And you can see we have up here all the way up from the very tip of the of, of our branch. And I'll zoom down so you can see some of those details. Because I think, you know, when we look at the details of things, that helps really reveal. Oh, there we go. Now we're getting into the, there we go. It really helps reveal a lot of the process. So I want you to notice that you can see some of the underdrawing here, okay? The basic shape of the bud here. And then also the branch and how the branch has this kind of constant movement, these ever so slight changes in angle that really give it that naturalistic look. I mean, that's how things grow. They tend to grow in sort of fits and starts depending on the season, correct? And then, and then also different, we're adding variety by, have, by having buds and cones that are in, that are in different stages. Notice too that one of the ways that we can create the illusion of space, so in that sense, we have some needles that are coming forward and some needles that seem in the back. We do this by changing the value of the of the hue. So remember when we look at the we look at these pine needles, the hue we see is a green, okay? But we change the value. We have a much darker green. Okay, so by value, we mean the lightness and darkness of objects. And so the darker green comes forward, the lighter green tends to recede. So I'm actually using all the same colors here. I'm just changing 
the I'm just changing how much water that I use to create a lighter color or a darker version of the same color. We do the same thing with pencil. For those of you who haven't used any color, that's perfectly fine. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to switch off my camera here for a second and let me go back here. All right. Hello. Welcome back. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start by getting about talking about what those basic skills are by starting with the pine cone. And what I'm going to ask you to have handy is to have handy a pencil. OK, it can be a 2H pencil or a B pencil. At this point in time, I'm going to be drawing with a B pencil. Now, if you plan now, a B pencil is a softer pencil. What does that mean? That means that it has less binder in it, which means that the graphite releases more for the same amount of pressure. So we're going to get a darker line for the same amount of pressure. Now, I'm using a B pencil because our digital tool here that makes the magic for us to be together this morning, um, it doesn't pick up light lines very, very well with the camera. So I'm using a darker pencil today to draw with. However, if you plan to try to put a little bit of color, because it's always fun to play with color, um, if you plan to put a little bit of color on your drawing, I would recommend that you that you use a an H pencil, which is it's always easy to remember. Uh, B for bold and H for hard. Okay, that's how I remember it. So the H pencil is going to be a harder pencil. You're going to get a lighter line for the same amount of pressure. It also won't be as messy when you add water to it, when you add uh, the water uh, based medium on top of it. Um, the graphite won't mix in and muddy up the colors. So uh, so that's why I recommend using an H pencil if you are going to put color on top. Otherwise, draw with a nice soft B pencil. You want to have an eraser handy. I'm fond of using a white plastic eraser. You can also use the classic pink drawing eraser. The difference between the two is that the pink one is a little more abrasive and the white one's a little more gentle. And so I tend to use the white eraser unless I really have to get it you know, eradicate something and then I bring in the pink eraser. Always important to test your pink eraser first because uh, some of them will actually leave the pink on your on your drawing paper. So test it in a corner to make sure that it doesn't do that. Uh, and then but and that's the other reason why I like the white plastic erasers is they don't do that because there's no pigment inside the inside the eraser itself. The other handy tool to have is a stump, okay? And stumps are very handy. Um, it's simply a rolled up piece of paper. I like to use these, and you might ask yourself, well, why can I just use my fingers? Now, there's two reasons why you wanna avoid using your fingers to blend values on your, uh, on your drawing. The first reason is, is that these can get into a smaller area and be far, far more exact. The other reason is, is that you have natural oils on your fingers and sometimes those oils can get onto the drawing and can actually affect the drawing surface and affect how the graphite is moving on the surface. So you want to be a little bit careful about that. You don't, you don't have to wear gloves. Um, and the only time I, if you ever have seen a drawing glove, the only time I ever use that is when I'm, I'm using ink or I'm doing something that I know it has to be pristine for illustrative illustration purposes. Um, but if you do want to be very, very cautious, you can always keep a piece of scrap paper under your hand if you have the habit of keeping your hand on the page. It's best to get out of that habit if you can help it, because you really should be drawing from your shoulder and from your elbow. OK, so generally I am drawing usually with the heel of my hand off of my page and 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 supported by by my elbow and moving that to make those kind of motions so uh, you get a lot more freedom and and funny enough a lot more control okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to switch my camera and we're going to talk about how to get started drawing okay and this is how to get started drawing 
anything. And we're going to end up with a pine cone today. Okay. So I will say goodbye to, to you for now. And then we'll go and look at my drawing pad. Now, I will show you uh, on, my, on, on my drawing pad here, you can see that I have my underneath here, this, this paper here is quite different from this paper. And again, this is, uh, this is just a, for, uh, so you know that you can have smooth paper and you can have rough paper. It's the other term, that, the technical term that you'll hear, especially or see when you go to a uh, when you go to an art supplier, is you'll hear cold press paper. This is cold press, where my finger is right now, and this is a hot press paper. Now, if you can imagine, it is exactly what it sounds like. The cold press paper is paper that when it is put through the mill in the factory, it goes through rollers that are in fact cold. And so you end up getting uh, you get end up getting a slightly rougher, more textured surface. Okay. The hot press paper is ironed. It goes through rollers that are hot. And those papers they uh, and they get a much smoother surface. Now I select my papers depending on the kind of effect that I wanna get. And also sometimes I've, I do it informed by my subject. So for today, because we're gonna be doing just some basic drawing, I don't necessarily wanna be working with the texture. Uh, and so we're going to, so I'm gonna be using a hot press paper. So that's why you see the difference there. Now you're gonna notice that I have here sketched, I have some basic shapes. If you can draw these five shapes, you'll be able to draw anything. The main shape that you want to begin with is always is the sphere. And so when we draw a sphere, we always look at the fact when before we draw any shape, we start to see how the shape relates to itself. So I'm going to encourage you now to draw along with me, just maybe on, you know, uh, on in, you can see I'm drawing on the upper edge of my paper here that I'm going to be drawing on uh, all for our entire class today. And uh, so you can draw on one part of your paper or you can take another page and do this. This is gonna be your warm up exercise to get you to sort of get you in the right frame of mind. So when we start with these five basic shapes, the first thing we always do, as I mentioned, is we look for those lines of symmetry and those major axes, okay? So when we have our sphere, you notice that the sphere is symmetrical about a vertical axis, and it is also symmetrical about a horizontal axis. So that's very important to keep in mind. So what you're going to, so, so we also notice that it is as tall as it is wide. Now for the sphere, that seems quite obvious, but it's gonna be more important as we proceed with these other shapes. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to imagine that our light source is coming from the upper from the from the upper left hand corner if you are right handed, okay, or the upper left hand corner if you are. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. The, the upper left hand corner if you're right handed, or the upper right hand corner if you're left handed. The main reason for changing the side of where the light comes from is because it's easier to work your shadows that way. So I'm going to start with my uh, with my camera up here. And I just realized that I am in fact right handed. So I need to switch. There we go. That that way I am not speaking backward to you. <laughs> So I'm I'm right-handed, so my light source is coming from the upper left-hand corner. And so if we use our imagination, we know that we're going to have a kind of crescent moon shape shadow on our sphere. So I'm going to put that shadow on there. And notice how you, by using the line, I'm going to go ahead and erase some of these, some of these uh, construction lines. By using line and value, we can create that, illu that illusion of a three-dimensional object. So we have our highlight is going to be 
facing the light source. And then as the surface of the sphere turns away, it gets, um, we have a shadow on that sphere. However, there's something that's somewhat counterintuitive that happens. I'm gonna soften down those edges there. And the, the important thing is, is within the shadow itself, okay? And really try to observe this as you're walking around in these next few days after this, after this workshop, because you'll see this. You'll notice that as the surface of the sphere turns away from the light source, it's actually darkest. This shadow is actually darkest right at the, at the point where the surface of the sphere has turned away from the light source. It's not darkest over here. In fact, there's always a little bit lighter over here, right next to that cast shadow. Mary Ellen, could you do us a favor? If you could center the sphere a little bit more, I think um, some happy. folks have it a little out of their um, how's, view. How's that? That is great. And then I think um, I think we might want to flip it back, actually, Mary Ellen. Right now, to us, it looks like, yep, that's perfect. So now the light source is coming from the upper left corner. OK. OK, great. I must be turned around for some reason. Well, thank you for your patience, folks. And thank you for letting us know. So Thanks, one of the things, so you're going to notice, so we've got our, we've got our highlight up here, OK? This area here, we have this is all in shadow. However, right where this turns away and the value of the dark side is a little bit darker right in here, this is called our turning shadow. And then as the surface of the sphere is facing the back part, okay, where we have our cast shadow and the cast shadow is always going to be slightly, slightly elongated and it's also a graduated value, meaning that it moves from dark to light. So it's going to be darkest, closest to the object. And then it's going to be lighter as it moves away. And you're also going to notice that with, with uh, the ground plane shadows or the cast shadow, that their edges are much softer. There's always a really nice surface. But notice this point of contrast. This little area here on the sphere, this reflected light, okay? So this is your reflected light. Okay. And this is your highlight up here. I always like to write it down because sometimes you're listening to someone and you're like, am I hearing that correctly? And this is your turning shadow. And this, of course, is your cast shadow. Oh, I'm going to learn how to spell on Saturday morning here. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to notice that it's quite dark next close to the object and then it fades away. And this area here, this reflected light, this is actually the light bouncing off of the ground back onto the surface of the sphere. And that's what gives us that wonderful that that wonderful roundness that our eye picks up this this lovely point of contrast that we create here. Now this exists with all of the all of the different shapes. So if we have an egg, okay, and right next to us, and we're going to notice that we do the egg, it's going to be symmetrical about a horizontal axis, but it is not symmetrical about a vertical axis, okay? And if we have this egg shape here, we're going to draw it such that Eggs typically, it's the bottom third that they're the widest at. So we can create those points like that, make some round, nice round end of the egg here, and then round it off up here. We want to make sure that we don't turn it into an almond or a teardrop shape. And then 
if we imagine again our light source from coming from the same place, we're going to have the exact same circumstances. So now, this week, when you're stuck in a staff meeting or something that's a little bit challenging to your attention, now you have the now, now you can practice your eggs and spheres and trying to make them look as round as you possibly can. Blend this out. And again, you can see, now when you have a drawing that looks meh, that's the way I, I like to say it. It just looks like everything, like nothing's happening. There's no sparkle then what you need is darker darks and lighter lights, okay? So you're gonna darken that down. You can bring in your eraser, pull out a little bit of contrast there, maybe darken down that turning shadow. The great thing about graphite is, is that it's very forgiving and it moves. And there you go. And you can have your egg looking very, very round. Now, if you really want to give it a sense of, of an illusion of space, you can even take, this is what stumps are great for, because once they're dirty, you can actually do a little bit of drawing with your stump. You can add a little bit of background with it. So the rules are the same. As we keep going down, we, if we're going to do, a, if we're going to have a cylinder, a cylinder shape, we're going to have the same, it, we're going to have an elliptical shape at the top, connect it here. This elliptical curve is going to be the same as that elliptical curve, okay? And again, if our highlight is our light source is coming from the same place, we're going to have a dark side and a light side. We'll have a turning shadow, okay? And then we'll also have, and we're going to keep, because of time and also space, because we're just warming up I'm going to make a little bit, we're going to abbreviate that shadow just a bit. And if you want to have your cylinder be hollow, you can put a little bit of shadow on the lighted side because, of course, it's casting a shadow on itself at that point. And you have a little bit of a hollow cylinder. The same goes true for the cone. Soften that edge always. A little bit of that turning shadow. And again, we can pull out just a little bit of the reflected light. So look for that reflected light when you're walking around. You're going to see it on tree trunks. You're going to see it on people's faces. And then when we have a basic cube, you just need to remember the top face of your cube is going to be the brightest part, the part facing the lighted side is going to be a middle tone and the part turning away is going to be the darkest value. And we can still put a little bit, a little bit of reflected light there. Here's our yeah. Could yes. you switch, uh, the cube to the center, if you don't mind? Thank you so yep. much. No problem. There we go. And then we go right over like that. So quick warm up. Now, what did this do? Well, this got us all warmed up to for all of the basic shapes that we'll need. We also got a sense of our value scale for our pencil. So we know that this is my darkest dark. And then as I fade across and to all the way, try to get all of those subtle shades of gray because this is just like if we were writing a poem, these are like all of the descriptive words our values are. These are the things 
These are the things that are going to define all of our elements. It, and every engaging drawing has a full value scale from your darkest value to your brightest light. And we create interest by creating points of contrast because uh, the human eye loves to look at contrast. So those are our basic skills that we're going to use today. And whenever you feel a little bit rusty, whenever you feel like you have this pencil and you don't know what it does, and or you're it has an unfamiliar feel to it, just take, you know, like we just did, we took about eight minutes to sit and draw some basic shapes and get your value scale down on a little piece of scrap paper, and you're really going to be warmed up and ready to go. Now, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to sharpen my pencil here. And I know it's always fun to see what, what people, what different things that people use. You're going to notice that I have a very not fancy pencil sharpener. I have to be honest with you. Um, after many years of trying all kinds of pencil sharpeners, electric ones, things like that, I just stick with the basic handheld pencil sharpener here that has the the larger diameter and the smaller diameter. It's a metal pencil sharpener. You can find it pretty much anywhere. It's inexpensive. Um, and that's what I use. I'm happiest with that. I haven't found that, um, I haven't, for me personally, I haven't found a relationship between a uh, better tip of my pencil and the a uh, higher price of a pencil sharpener. This is probably the cheapest thing on the market and it does just great. So that's what I use. <laughs> and so, so let's start thinking about our subject now. We've got our, our we've got our um, basic shapes there and here's our subject. Here's our, our pine cone. And uh, I chose this pine cone because this one was different from the ones that we used uh, for those of you who were here last week. Uh, these pine cones you're going to notice are a lot, a lot rounder. And I thought that this one would create some nice variety. It's also a lovely variation of a cylinder shape. Okay. So I want you to see that no matter how complex our object is, and it, as as you'll notice, we're looking at the, the pine cone here and we look at these different shapes. You know, this really we can reduce this down to a cylinder and and treat it like that. We notice that it has a major axis that all of these different parts of the pine cone come in to that center, that central axis. OK, and. If we look at it really carefully, we're going to notice that they have a relation, they actually have a proportional relationship to each other. And so just to talk about that proportional relationship, I'm going to, I'm going to, all plants have rhythm and pattern to each other and something as artists that we really want to train our eye to notice. So when we look at the pine cone, I want you to notice that when we look at this point here, and then here, and we go around, we go down to here, that we're descending and going around as we look at the different points here. Now, I'm going to switch my screen for a moment and share with you what that relationship is. And uh, let me go here. It'll take just a moment. And what that relationship is, is it is in fact the, it is in fact the logarithmic spiral. Now, you might recall this from your basic geometry class. And, but this, you also may immediately see seashells in this. So most familiar with this spiral would be the Nautilus shell or other uh, uh, gastropods, other snail shells, but this occurs in nature. And where we see it very, very often, it, where we encounter it, is in the layout or the arrangement of sunflower seeds in the head of a sunflower. 
So you can see it overlaid here, but then I encourage you look over here and try to follow the line and you'll see that logarithmic spiral. Now, this is called phyllotaxis, okay? And this occurs in plants. It's extremely common arrangement for plants. And you can see it's a three, it's a three dimensional arrangement. So we start, by, so at the starting point and then it descends down. And so the logarithmic spiral isn't just in two dimensions, it's actually in three. So let's look at our pine cone again. So as we look at the pine cone, I hope that you can see the phyllotaxis going on, okay? So we're going to just take a moment and look at this pine cone in this dimension. So this is going to be, this is as if we're looking at it straight on, okay? And you're going to see that we're going to have this point here, okay? It's going to be our centermost point. And then we have a secondary scale right there. And then we have, we're going around the clock right here. We're going to have a third scale. We're going to see a little bit more of it, okay? And we know it overlaps, okay? And then we're going to go over to a larger scale over on this side. Now, this isn't necessarily a particularly attractive or desirable perspective to draw our pine cone from. But by doing a quick little sketch like this, we're going to get a sense of the order of the pine cone and the shape of the scales and how they overlap. I very, very often when I have a subject that seems so complex that I'm, I'm somewhat overwhelmed by it. I just try to draw it from just quick sketches. And by quick sketches, you know, you've spent five to 10 minutes just drawing what I see and to see how the subject reveals itself to me. What is that? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry, but could could we shift so we see the, the pine cone a little bit more head on? That's fabulous. Thank okay. you. Good. Thank you for keeping me on perspective. When I'm drawing, it's hard for me to look up and at the camera. So this is great. Thank you. And so you can see that, you know, I'm starting to get, and it's kind of fun because I'm going to do this just because it's a fun thing to do. What you can begin, if I go to the different points of the scale, you can see that logarithmic spiral beginning to emerge, which is really kind of fun to see. But this is just, as I said, this is just a little sketch. This is just, we are getting to know our pine cone. We're going to draw it, actually. The, one, the, the bulk of the time we're going to spend is drawing it from from a more uh, a more lengthwise side but we can see that now and we get a sense the other thing that we get a sense of too is is that we can start to see that those scales in our pine cone actually are a bit folded i'm going to take out my my logarithmic spiral here but they're a little bit folded so I know that I'm going to have a kind of dark side to them. And I know that, of course, when they get in towards the center, they're going to be much darker inside here. So I'm starting to get a sense of what's going on dimensionally with my pine cone. Now let's look at the other end. So we're going to turn our pine cone over and we'll see if we look really carefully Okay, and remember, you're, the, 
any kind of relationship that you find in your pine cone, it might not be perfect because, you know, as I said, you know, with nature, things are growing and sometimes it affects the growth pattern of it. But here's our stem. You always want to look for the stem when you're drawing any kind of any kind of botanical subject, um, flowers, things like that. It always will help keep you kind of grounded and keep the sort of sense of connection going on. Oops, that's not quite big enough. And I'm just sketching again the back side of the pine cone. And I'm noticing this time as I sketch this part, one of the things that really catches my eye here is the is how they're like little shingles on a roof. And it's easy to imagine that this pine cone hangs downward because you could see how the water would would run right off of it. And again, I'm starting to see how those, how this different scale, how each scale overlaps and relates to the other. And once I kind of have that sense of the proportion and the shape and how those proportions and shape relate to each other, my subject begins to look quite convincing at that point. Now you'll notice, okay, we talked about looking at the pine cone this way and seeing a cylinder. You'll notice that I began both of our sketches, okay? I began both of those with a circle. And since I've done that, one of the things that I'll do is I will treat it as such. I'm going to darken down ever so slightly. The shadow side here, I'm going to treat this stem as a little cylinder. And go and get it. Go ahead and start to blend a little bit here. And remember, I mentioned to you that they're like little shingles. So I'm going to put in that little bit of a darker side. Oh, great opportunity here. Okay. Where I'm going to pull out a little bit of contrast here seem to have erasers all over the place right now. Had to move a few things to make some room here. This is going to cast a shadow onto here. And you can see where I'm really starting to get a lot of that value scale in defining that, that stem And one of the things that I'll probably do just a little bit is, in general, just lighten up the things that are in the background. And then, now, one of the things that I want you to notice that as I'm kind of practicing my textures and things before I get into the larger drawing or my, my main drawing is... One of the things I want you to uh, to notice is, is I'm not uh, I'm trying to keep all of those values of my value range. I'm always trying to have the full the full value range. I want to get that bright, bright highlight there. I think I just made it a little bit gray. My eraser is a bit dirty. 
one of the things you can do with your eraser is you can always uh, use a little exacto knife and cut it. Yeah. Okay. So those are my two sketches. I'm not going to elaborate on these too much anymore because they really, um, I've, I feel like I have a, an understanding of it. Now, the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look really closely at a typical scale on my pine cone. And I'm going to draw one individual scale. So what I'm going to do is I have a, I have a, a sacrificial pine cone here, a pine cone that's going to give me a scale. I'm going to pull one off of it. I usually try to have, particularly for botanical subjects, I try to have two. So there's one that sometimes I can take apart and there's another one that I can look at in the full piece. So here I have a, a sense of it. And I want you to notice that they almost have like a little bit of a, it's almost like a fingernail at the end of the scale there. And then notice that the texture is quite different. This is very smooth and shiny. And then the texture here has a, has a nice long grain on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep that nearby and we're gonna zoom down a little you can see that I started one scale there. And I notice also the shape of it. Hey, Mary Ellen. Yes. Our uh, view seemed to have, have flipped a little bit on the camera and I'm wondering if we could um, flip okay. back. Yeah, I'm not sure why it did that. Is that better? Um, we're still um, like 90 degrees shifting. Hmm. Well, now we're, well, now we're a different way. How funny. It seems to be going. Um, I'm not sure why it did that. That's, let's try that. Nope. That's my ceiling. <laughs> um, we don't want that. We don't want that to happen. Oh, my apologies. I'm not really sure why it did that. Um, no worries. Thanks everyone for bearing with us while we will we'll troubleshoot. Yeah, let me see if I can, how's that? Are we back? Yeah, okay. we're back. Okay, I, I must have bumped it, my apologies. Okay, so there we go. Hopefully we're zoomed down a little bit there. Okay, good, good stuff. So now we're back here, okay? Hopefully that just gave everybody a chance to catch up who was trying to draw along. So you can see, sometimes it's just so much fun to have your subject right next to you. And one thing that I do notice is that these taper quite a bit as they go in. So you can see I captured the shapes first. So the shape of that sort of that end of it. There's also a little tip here where there's usually a lot of sap. And then I'm going to put in my value using these nice, nice long lines that go up the that go up the length of the the um the scale and then here i'm going to put in a little bit of value okay that goes along the roundness of the scale i like to do this because i think the eye picks up the direction that the values are put down i'm going to do a little blending now with my stump I'm not bearing down very hard. I'm just gently brushing. And I'm gonna put in that turning shadow because that's curved this way. And I'm gonna put that turning shadow in, but I'm gonna try to leave a little bit of that highlight there. That, I'm sorry, not highlight, that, that uh, reflected light. I'm also going to make the lighted side even lighter. And for that, I'm actually going to pull out a kind of eraser that you might have seen, but might not have used yet. And this is called, it's sometimes called a gummy eraser. It's, uh, it's basically a needed, it's, it's, you, when you purchase them, you'll find them as needed erasers. They look like a piece of gray gum. Let me, oops, 
I'm getting crumbs around. And they're extremely gentle. And you can shape them so that you can go in and pull out in very specific areas. So if you have a kneaded eraser, you can use that. If not, as I said, one of the things that I like to do is you just either use the tip very, very lightly of whatever eraser you have, or um, as I mentioned before, you can cut your eraser and have little pieces that you can use to sort of fit the bill as you as you need them. And so there's my there's my little my little pine cone scale. Now one of the things you're going to notice is, is I'm going in in these areas where there's like a little, you know, where one form kind of touches another form. And I'm making a little, I'm going to zero down into that very closely so you can see that. And you're going to notice that I've made just some real darks, just but very sparingly, where there are sort of points of contact where the form changes. Okay. Now, my reason in doing that is to create points of, is to create different points of contrast. Now, the human eye loves that, the, as I mentioned before, but also, what we can also do is in some areas, we can make the line almost go away and then have it reappear. And you can see how by softening down in some of those areas, that line and using the eraser, we can do two things. We can create what's called lost and found line. So our eye follows not a line, but a rhythm of dark and light and dark and light and dark and light. And then also by using this eraser and or by using your eraser, any eraser that you've got, you can enhance the texture. So we're both drawing is both additive and subtractive. We can add graphite and then we can take away to help create that pattern of light that's created by the texture. And then we can reinforce the lighted side and the darker side that give it that real turning, that real three-dimensional aspect. So let's recap and give you a moment to breathe and to sharpen up your pencil and I want you to notice that we started, let's zoom out a bit. And remember, it might take a moment for your, for your computer to catch up. So don't panic, okay? So I've got my tools here, okay? Basic tools, our basic shapes. We're always looking for, you know, the main axes of symmetry. We're looking for how the object relates to itself, okay, both in, in proportion. We are keeping in mind how value works on a form, highlight, turning shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, and a bit of background value to give it a sense of space. We keep in mind our overall value scale of whatever medium we're working with, our, from our darkest dark to the lightest light, because having that variety of value lends visual interest to our subject. And then remember, pencil and paper they're, they're as cheap as you get, okay? So do some sketches, get to know your subject, look for those patterns, look for those shapes, look for the, that sense of order so that you can understand how even a complex, a seemingly complex subject, okay, can be broken down into an understandable 
an understandable form. And then you can draw it with real meaning. So let's go ahead and get started on drawing our whole pine cone, okay? Now, in drawing the pine cone, if I begin, I'm going to put some things out of the way here, and I'm going to zoom us down again. So remember, it'll take a moment for, for us to adjust, okay? I have my pine cone here, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this basic shape of the pine cone. So here, and you're going to see that I have that curved axis, just like that. And I'm going to just draw that nice, and actually it's gonna help me if I sort of angle it off just a little bit. I'm gonna draw from the actual object. So that means I'm gonna be able to measure directly from the object. And I'm gonna go ahead and put on my stem. Now I want you to notice that I tend to draw very geometrically first. And those of you who were with me last week, when we, you might recall, when we were working on the pine branch, we approached it the same way. And you might say, but wait a second, it's, it's curved. It's a very soft curve. We can get there we can get there with that soft curve. We can, uh, we, that can come later. This enables us to really get that curve and the way it's turning very accurately, rather than trying to make sure that we get the smooth arc perfect the first time. So it's a little bit easier, I think, if we, if we do it like this. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my full extent of my object, okay, and my width of it. And I can actually take my object and just go like that and do that. And now as I'm looking at it, I notice I can measure directly off of the object to get that, those basic shapes now. From here, this is pretty much a cylinder in here. And then I notice it begins to get a bit smaller as we go down to there. So I've blocked in, this is called blocking in the shape. We have our shape all blocked in now. So I'm going to actually start at the stem here. And you'll notice that I'll occasionally work back and forth between one, the very, very end of my pine cone here, okay? And, and I'm gonna try to keep, let me see if I get, there we go. I wanna make sure my pine cone and the drawing are in, in the same frame there so you can see that, okay? Might need to straighten that out just a little. There we go. I'm gonna bring that up just a little. There, you mean not quite as as bent. Sometimes you want to. Sometimes I add a little bit of swing to it, as long as it's just to give it a little bit of a visual interest. Um, as long as it's not outside of the sort of characteristic of the plant itself. So now what I'm going to do, I'll begin by establishing the width of my, of the stem here, okay? So I'm gonna compare it to my actual one there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to measure where are all those little tiny, these little tiny, um, scales. And this scale right here, this one that I'm looking at, is actually almost almost directly on the axis. It's bent off to the side just a, just a bit. And I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and bend that off to the side like that. And then there are some assorted 
little scales in here that haven't quite resolved themselves. And I'm gonna go ahead and put those in on the bottom. So I have that. Now down at the other end here, and again, I you'll probably notice I've been lightening up a lot of my a lot of my construction lines as I work. So I'm just going to lighten that up a little bit and I'm going to go there's this one last scale that sticks out at the end there right here. Okay. And there's one that's just at the bottom there that overlaps and a large one, a larger one that comes out here and put that in there. So now I'm starting to establish this sort of connection and rhythm of those scales. So from our smallest ones to the terminus ones over here. Now, the other thing that I'm going to do is, is that now, because again, because of our, we're, we're working on camera here and I need to flood this with light so that we can be seen. Uh, one of the things that I would do if I were drawing this and that you should do when you're drawing this at your, in, uh, at your own home is that you should keep in mind that it's best to have your light set up so that you have your light source coming from that angle that you're most comfortable with. So I'm going to actually just do a little bit of shading here because this is going to be my darker side very, very lightly. But I'm just putting that there to remind me that that's, that's going to be the darker side. I'm going to put in that big shadow and have it, have it there already. And at this point, I'll, I'll definitely lighten up that center line. I don't want it to become overwhelming. As I said, normally I would draw these lines very, very light so that only I could see them. And then what I'm going to do is now I'm going to proceed in a very workmanlike fashion and I'll zoom down a little more. Okay, so you can see exactly where I'm working. I'm going to proceed in a very workmanlike fashion, um, drawing my scales and I'm going to you know, try and what I, I'll get started with, I want you to notice is I draw the center line of the scale, even though I may not necessarily see it. I draw that center line to always keep me oriented to the proper attachment to the center of that pine cone. I really do not want to lose sight of that and sometimes you know you're going to notice too one of the things that i do is i draw i do what's what i like to call drawing through you'll notice that sometimes i draw something in such a way that it's as if it's transparent but it's on top of the other object and that helps me and i and i hope that it helps you, um, it helps me stay aligned and oriented so that I know that my shapes have balance. So I'm gonna keep proceeding. Notice too that I'm switching sides. I'm moving side to side. It's really important. Um, you don't want to fall in love with one side and then try to capture the same kind of balance on the opposite side. It's, it's nearly impossible to capture that again. Now, also too, as I'm, as I'm drawing, I'm keeping in mind that sense of overlap and that, you know, that, that wonderful $5 word that we learned, that's what my grandmother would have called it. When you, whenever, 
whenever I used a fancy word, she'd be like, where did you learn that $5 word? I always thought that was a cute, a cute thing. Um, that $5 word that we learned, that was our, our phylo taxes. So you want to make sure you gotta impress your botany friends. <laughs> We all know we, we, we all know that uh, it's it's the botanist that everybody wants to talk to at the cocktail party. <laughs> oh, what tour it were. And and again, you see that um, just I'm and I and and yes, it's true. I know it's it. I, it would sound terrifying if I had said this at the beginning, um, but it's it's true. I'm drawing every scale. And I'm actually drawing every individual scale. Now, unlike when we drew the tree, those of you who were with us last week, unlike when we drew the tree and we were, we were, we were looking at the masses of the leaves and that was because of the, the distance we are from the tree. But since this is one of those wonderful moments when it's all about the detail. Hey, Mary Ellen, can you reorient us and remind us which scale you're on? Uh, I am, oh, that's a great, question. Um, <laughs> I just drew this scale. This scale right here is this scale right here. So, and, yeah, I'm moving. For, for those of you who are counting at home, <laughs> more power to you. I was almost for a moment, I was like, uh-oh, I'm not sure I can answer that question. It's like, because I'm looking and going back and forth. I don't always. And then sometimes I notice that there's one that I just barely see in the background, and I'm adding that one in. And this one's very interesting. This one is the one. Oops, let me let me bring this down. I just realized I went out of this thing here for you. There we go. This one, I can see actually the inside of it. It's a little bit different. That one, I can see just like that. And, and now I'm into the ones that are right here in this area here. And again, I'm just keeping that, you know, it really helped to draw this little scale up here because this is the one that I'm thinking of when I'm, when I'm drawing all of these. Now, the other thing too that you can do, and I hope I don't blow anybody's mind by doing this. If you get to a point where you're like, wait a second, I, I'm just not too comfortable drawing things. You can turn your page if you want to, but remember you have to keep your subject at the same, at oriented the same way, because otherwise you're going to be looking at it from a different, from a different angle. But you always can turn your page if you become uncomfortable. So as you're drawing, you know, my, I, one of the things I love to tell people who are just getting started drawing, just trying to get comfortable drawing is, is it's, it's just like, you know, anything else. If you had to, if, if some point in your life you learned an instrument or a sport, you know, you, you had to practice and, you know, you learned basic skills and I always like to recall when when my son was little and um, we would go to the, you know, we would go to the soccer games and my husband and I are are, are, are beekeepers also. And we we um, we used to call the little five year olds. We used to call it beehive soccer because you always knew where the ball was because it was the where the little the little children were all around the ball. No one played position. And um, but then as they get older and they practice and there's more strategy, you know, their skills increase and, you know, their subtlety in under un, in understanding the game uh, increases. And it's the same with drawing. And, and, you know, we have to do our scales, you know, practicing those 
practicing these little shapes up here, you know, that's like doing your scales, doing these little quickie study sketches, that's doing your scales. But then, you know, in the end, there's just no substitute for, for practicing um, and just drawing as much as you can. And, and it just, and I think you'll be, you'll be surprised at how quickly your skills will increase if you, if you practice regu uh, regularly. Now, as I've been doing this, you've probably noticed I, I've been cleaning up a lot of those construction lines, okay? And I just went through and reinforced the dark side here, okay? I'm also going to come in and I'm going to darken down in the interior here where I know there are going to be shadows and we're going to start to get because this is what I'm looking at is how it gets it's lighter on the end here but darker in that interior and so I'm going to start to put in some of those cast shadows that the scales are actually casting onto one another and you can see by doing that we're also getting a lot more definition for our subject in general. Now, I'm not neglecting the ones on the outside, but the ones that are on the back there, these, these ones back here, I'm not gonna put too much into them right now. And the reason being is I, I want it ultimately to look very rounded. And so I do not want my subject, I, do, I don't want everything to come forward. I, I, I do want, I'm gonna take a break here. I want some things to fade as they go to the background and some things to come forward. And these parts that are gonna come forward now, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to start to spend a little bit more time on the detail of these scales that are right, right up in front here. So I'm gonna to start to put in that that little smooth tip that they have. I just blocked it in a little bit before, but now I'm going in and really trying to capture that. And again, remembering that each scale has this raised, it has a bit of a raised margin in it. And also that the text, there's that little texture change. I think a lot of times these days, you know, we have so much of an expectation of things being instant and that that there's sort of this myth that if we get it fast, it's going to be more, it's going to be satisfying. And I actually find the opposite to be quite true. And, and drawing really reinforces that, that, you know, the, the, the more time you spend looking at a subject, the more it reveals itself to you. And that's, that's time really well spent, really discovering the natural world and just the, the miracle of these detailed objects that are around us, these detailed living things that are around us. Oh, my pencil tip is broken. I'll give you a chance to catch up and take a look at the drawing with my hand away while I'm sharpening up. 
I'm actually having something happen right now that is um, it's a happy accident. My um, one of my former colleagues has a wonderful term. She calls it an art accident. I, I love that. And um, my pencil tip, I keep sharpening it and it's breaking. And there's a reason for that. If you've ever had that happen, um, if you if you drop a pencil, the the the, the center barrel of the graphite. Graphite is actually quite brittle. And um, if you drop it on the ground and it really lands hard, it will shatter part of the pencil in there. And that's actually what I was contending with, the little part of the pencil that, that had broken. And so you just have to sharpen through to do it. I'm doing some corrections here, not completely happy with some of these. Some of these are still a little, a little wonky. So I'm gonna get those, get those a little bit cleaned up. I just think it's amazing when I look at, at something like a pine cone that the the complexity is just awe inspiring. And you know, they they just quietly grow and you know, make seeds and do their thing while we're rushing around. And we don't really notice them. The one thing that I do love when I go walking is noticing the uh, different voices trees have when the wind blows, how they have a, uh, each one has a different sound to it. You know, pine trees always have this very soft voice. So we're getting our, our pine tree. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back through here, paying a little more attention to my margins. And I'm starting to And now I'm starting to put in some of those darkest darks just in a few places. You want to be careful with that. Don't, don't rush to, to get it really dark. That you can take it away, but you're, you're just, you're sort of making work for yourself because you're, the odds are very high that you're going to have to. And you may notice as I go through my drawing, I, I go on, I kind of, I kind of kid myself and that when, as I go through, I'm like, okay, now I'm on, you know, the, I'm, I'm re I'm doing a little patrol now where I'm reinforcing that center, that center line. And I'm getting that darker side of the, of the scale a little bit darker just kind of reinforcing that all the way around. And, you know, and I go ahead and do that all the way down. Because again, I, I can't reiterate this enough is, is the importance of working the whole drawing. Work the whole drawing. It is so tempting to fall in love with one aspect of the drawing, but, you know, you, you don't, 
you know, one characteristic, you know, having great values doesn't make a necessarily a great drawing. It's it's the whole package. <laughs> kind of like marriage and friendship. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. Mary Ellen, with these uh, last eight minutes or so, can I ask some of our audience questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, one of our first questions is, how do you sharpen that paper stump? Oh, that's a great question. Um, they're actually disposable. If you want to clean them, uh, so if it's if it's really if it's really really dirty, I mean, these cost about ten cents a piece, so you don't really have to worry about. And they're one hundred percent recyclable. But if you do say, if you're using uh, a if a color gets on it, or if it's just really dark and messy, a piece of sandpaper and just rubbing it on the sandpaper will clean it and will sharpen it. And and you can just do that. But generally, you can buy these things by by the bag. And you know, five dollars will give you almost a lifetime worth of stumps. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next question is: um, When you drew the circles when we were first sketching uh, the top and bottom of our pine cones, did you use a compass to draw those? Yes, actually, I did. I did that just for our um, ju just for a. Uh, the purpose of being uh, having a little bit of speed, but if you do want to draw a circle, this it's actually a nice straight line, right in just draw one right in half, okay, and then measure top and bottom, and then measure it from side to side, nice and even, and then one, two, three and four for arcs and that's how you just draw those uh, draw it just like that so it's it's really not it, it's just one of those things with practice when you just draw like a just a simple t shape and even you know evenly distanced four points and then and then drawing your your four arcs and then you can just adjust it as you need to. Thank you. Um, our next audience question. Um, this person is having trouble getting the scales in proportion to the overall outline. In other words, if they draw their cylinder first and then try to draw the scales, they run out of rows about two thirds of the way up through the pine cone. Can you give any hints for keeping the scales and the cone in proportion? Yes, what you what you want to do is keep your subject close by. And then one of the things that I find uh, it helps me is so if I measure and let me move, let me move up into the camera a little bit more. So I'm literally measuring off of my subject to just take my fingertips, measure over here. And then from then what I can do is to this tip here, to this to this scale, I'll measure that and I'll make, there's, there's that scale right there. Okay, so I have that one right there. And then if I think, hmm, that looks, a, that one thing looks a little bit big, let's measure it from the tip again. And then I have my, my I have my scale right there. And then I can measure again. So measuring from that same point each time to help you kind of work your way down work your way down that pine cone. And along those same lines, Mary Ellen, um, some folks are wondering, how do you kind of keep track of the scales as you go along? Um, one person is wondering, do you count the, the rows? Um, do you note the spirals as you go around or is it sort of approximate? Well, it's uh, uh, so that's a that's a really good question. So the first thing is is that if I'm sketching as scientific illustrator, um, the 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 uh, the frightening answer is yes, I count the scales and and I measure it, uh, and I actually use calipers and I measure it. 
when I'm when I'm drawing for myself and I'm drawing to enjoy my subject, of course, I'm not going to hold myself to that kind of, you know, the, the, that kind of standard, a sort of scientific standard. So what I do do is, again, I take note of as, as um, you know, these are where all the smaller ones are. They stopped kind of there. And then there's a group of ones where this is where it gets to be like the most mature scale. And then all of these scales in here are very mature. So I'll make a note that that is right along that line there. And I do note their angles. So this one is facing directly in, this one's slightly angled. And so I continue to do it is as you know from the larger area into break it down into smaller areas and then relating each scale to itself to to another scale if that if that makes sense thank you that's really helpful um let's see here i think those are our audience questions so far we might have a few pop into the chat and and i'll let you know Okay. All right. And what I'll do is, um, while people are, are looking at that, one of the things I can show folks is um, there is, an, uh, and all of these pictures will be, uh, are on the website here. You can see here's another drawing that I started. Okay. This is actually the same pine cone. Okay. So you can see I started it going this way to get that sort of swing to it. And then you'll notice that, you know, I have the, the every single one I've drawn in just the basic shape of it. And then I've started to put in all of the, uh, I've started to put in the values on there. Now this one, for those of you who are new with the pencils, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. This is the difference uh, between a B pencil, which is what I've been drawing with, and an H pencil, which is much lighter. This would be something that I that I would probably watercolor over and and do and and do that. The to also see another one set up from a different angle. Let me scooch over here, and so these are different pine cones. These are the ones that uh, from the Eastern white pine that I was using last, uh, uh, that I was using last week, as opposed to the Southern coastal pine is what we've been drawing this week, is you can see from each different angle how I began the drawing. So you'll notice I used that cylinder bottom right here, and then that conical shape and it's all around the central axis that attaches to the branch. Same thing here, that cylinder bottom that I have, and I'm drawing it as if it's glass. And then of course it attaches in the center and then comes up this way in order to get that overall shape. And then you can see where I've actually put the ends, that edge, and just made it like flat little tiles going in toward thing in or in towards the center of the cone in order to get the perspective correct on all of the different scales and then i would go back in and refine this further so and you could see on the bottom one and i'll zoom down into that where this one is actually just in progress where you can see how I've started to give those flat little tiles that I originally drew it as, and I'm starting to give them some more detail and also some, that's where the curve starts coming in in order to capture that at the real shape of it. But by drawing it geometrically first, I don't invest a lot of time into detail that I might have to erase because I didn't have it set up right in the first place. So it's a way of sort of breaking down the drawing from, from larger, basic, more basic shapes into smaller, more detailed shapes each time. Thanks, Mary Ellen. And we had one final question pop into the chat that I'll ask before yeah. we um, 
before we head off for the day. Um, someone is asking, how do you get those good mid-tones using the stump? And then how do you pluck out white highlights like the sap on your pine cone? Oh, the sap is so much fun. I, yeah, no, well, so first of all, here's the bad news. Sap is last don't highlights are always last okay so you always want to you'll notice that i moved and i'm gonna slide over here real quick you'll notice that i really began my drawing at this end of the scale and into the middle tone and then started adding the darks and then the very very last sort of the 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 sprinkles on top of the Sunday is coming in with your eraser and just plucking out those highlights. Now, tools for highlights. As I said, you can manipulate your eraser by cutting it with an X-Acto knife. You can also get a kneaded eraser. And then there's a very old fashioned tool called an erasing shield, which is a little piece of metal that you can use that actually helps you mask different, just little lines and shapes. And you can use that, it's a draftsman's tool and you can find them still, they're still available. It's called an erasing shield. And, uh, and then you can go ahead and just start to pluck those pluck those little highlights out. But that's really the last part of the drawing. This drawing right now, I would regard as being about 75% done. I would sharpen up my pencil now, come back in, start really putting in some, what I like to refer to as the fiddly bits. So I would start to come in and get in those areas where there's going to be some sap, where there's going to be a little, uh, you know, a big dark next to a bright white. I would start to go in and do that. And then after that, I would come in and pluck out the, uh, the really bright highlights with with my um, with my kneaded eraser or my uh, or my nice clean white eraser there, but this is this is sort of the fun part. This is the part that everybody likes to rush to get to. But just notice in this little spot here where I went in and put in that point of contrast, how immediately your eye just goes boom right to that spot. That's where you want to look right away, and so. You want to use that detail, you want to use that contrast in such a way that you lead the person's eye, the viewer's eye, from one end of your drawing to another end of your drawing so they look at the whole thing and that it's a it's a, a, a full, it's a full work. It's a unified work of art in that in that way. I hope that helps. Yeah, that was really fabulous. And I just want to thank you so much, Mary Ellen, and thank everyone for joining us today for a really fabulous program.